Good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, webinar on satellite communication, mentioned SANCOM for aviation. So just to remind that it's a series of webinars organized in close conjunction with the CESAR Joint Undertaking, uh, the CESAR Diplomat Manager, and also today the European Space Agency, in order to present uh, a specific SATCOM system, which is IRIS. So this webinar is a continuation of a series of webinars that were organized on LDAX, and we have had the first one on uh, SATCOM a few, uh, a few weeks ago. Before starting this, uh, this webinar, you may remember our colleague Vaughn Mayola uh, that passed away suddenly on 29 January 2022. He was participating at the previous webinar that we have had uh, a few weeks ago. So we are presenting our condolences to his family and uh, to his colleague as well. And we are suggesting to wind one minute of silence in the memory of Vaughn. So I will stop now for one minute in memory of Vaughn. So, thank you very much, Vaughan, for all your contributions. So, coming back on the topic of today, the purpose is how to introduce the digitalizations with the modern air ground communication, secure digital communication, supporting machine air to air and ground communication in order to have applications that will bring automations. But it was identified 10 years ago uh, at the Air Navigation Conference by IKO. In the meantime, the mobile technology have evolved. They have been developed uh, in Europe by the CESAR, mainly the CESAR joint undertaking in, connection, in close conjunction with IKO. So the time for implementation decision is coming. So in Europe, uh, we are running for the time being on parallel uh, of this development, technological development, some uh, documentation to allow our direct network director of technology, which is called the ND Tech, uh, and joint uh, CNS stakeholder platform for European decision. Basically, we are developing a business case for new air ground technology. Uh, there are several options, and SATCOM NG is one of the options that the purpose of this webinar to explain uh, these new services, which is the IRIS services, as far as SATCOM is concerned. So the SATCOM awareness campaign, the purpose is basically to increase the awareness on SATCOM technology. It doesn't mean that SATCOM is selected at that stage. It's one of the options of the strong option that is considered. And for that, we have organized a series of two to four, to four webinars. So together uh, with panel of experts, and you will see later on our colleague from the European Space Agency will introduce uh, the panels for the discussion today. We have had a few weeks ago the SATCOM for Aviation, the stakeholders perspective, providing an overview on the, on the SATCOM technology. Today, we are going to address Iris SATCOM, a system that has been designed for aviation. So we expect to have a one hour 32 to two hours discussions. And it will be followed by other seminars on the SATCOM maturity and deployment that will take place on the 14th of March, 2022. So for today, um, we are going to, this webinar is going to be moderated by uh, the European Space Agency. And I'm pleased to introduce our colleague, Antonio Garuti. So Antonio is the head of uh, telecommunication uh, office. Sorry. At the European Space Agency in ESTEC, they are based in ESTEC. 
uh, in the Netherlands and those responsible for the implementation of a large number of European space agency private partnership program with industry in the telecom domain. He has been at the European Space Agency for the, 20, for the last 24 years, working in various functions in this organization. So he was the program manager for the telecom satellite development from 2003 to 2006, and is responsible for the procurement of the Galileo Geov and NB satellite. So before joining, he has been working in the Italian space industry, reaching the responsibility of head of department for satellite power system and equipment. So, Antonio is holding uh, a master degree in electronic nuclear engineering from the Politecnico di, Malin, di Milano. I'm expecting that pronouncing well, uh, Antonio, and I hand over to you for the moderation of this webinar. It's okay. Thank you, Jackie, and uh, thank you everyone for joining. I see the number of participants is growing. And uh, thank you for, to Aerocontrol for organizing this uh, and giving us this opportunity. And thanks to the panelists and the speakers that we'll see later on. Um, as has been said, <clears throat> today's webinar is focused on uh, IRIS. IRIS is a uh, development of a complementary data link for, uh, for, uh, from satellite uh, for aviation. And uh, today's main objective is, uh, is to increase, to grow awareness and confidence on uh, the technical aspects, of course, but also on the programmatic aspects and to see that eventually IRIS is becoming a, a, a service, uh, a real service uh, uh, provision in the near future. So today uh, we have an agenda where there will be a, a short introduction uh, from either side, uh, also recalling what we discussed in the last webinar, as mentioned by Jackie, we had a, a general we webinar on SATCOM uh, for aviation. And then uh, uh, this would be introduced by, by, by the European Space Agency. IMARSAT will take care of defining uh, uh, in more details motivation, architectural definition of IRIS, performance requirement, and, uh, and maturity as well. Um, and uh, we uh, later on, we will see also the, the view of the avionic manufacturer. Uh, and namely Airbus and Oni will, will explain what is the status of the avionic development and what is the perspective for ARIS implementation in the future. And uh, at last, but not least, of course, the SSP, which is the European Satellite Service Provider, uh, will take care of providing some insight on the view uh, from the uh, service perspective uh, uh, approach. Uh, I like to to also take the opportunity to to underline again that the 14th of March we'll have another webinar addressing for Iris from the Iris point of view mainly maturity and uh, and um, verification validation aspects because uh, of course we know for the commu community is important to have a clear understanding of results and performances. So we'll talk about maturity, validation, possible uh, uh, analysis of uh, fleet equipage and the uh, certification approach. So uh, IASA will be part as well of this, uh, of this webinar. Uh, a couple of uh, points concerning uh, uh, practical aspects uh, for question and answer. Of course, we, we tend uh, for experience to go through all the presentation and having a, a session at the end, but of course there is a uh, a button at the bottom of your screen, there is a question and answer tag that you can use to input your questions. And uh, in between presentation, we also present some uh, some question and uh, to have a pool and to see what, what is the reaction of the audience on that. It will be interesting to have your your support and your answer on that side. So I'll take uh, the opportunity to present Martina Angelone, which is working with me uh, as IRI system engineer. Martina Angelone received a master's degree in telecommunication engineering at the University of Pisa in 2008. She joined ESA, the European Space Agency, in 2010 as a communication uh, as engineer in the technology directorate, but joined later on telecommunication integrated application uh, directorate as system uh, engineer for the IRIS program. She is responsible for the implementation aspect of the system. And uh, she's also uh, involved in several aviation standardization group like Eurocontrol and Eurocontrol FCI task force. And she's contributing to the SATCOM data link definition for the future. 
Martina will take care of introducing uh, our view on the matter. Thank you very much. And uh, Martina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antonio. Can you hear me well? Yes, so OK. OK, so I'll give a very quick introduction for this webinar, focusing more on IRIS, but uh, starting with a brief summary on the previous takeaways from the webinar number one of this series, which was uh, held in uh, January. Uh, highlighting some of the technological uh, takeaways that we can uh, summarize here. So um, we can state that SATCOM rep represents a key enabler for aviation services and that focusing on aviation communication services requirements like safety, security, continuity, availability, integrity and latency, especially for uh, safety critical air traffic services, SATCOM is intrinsically compliant with those requirements because it's provi it provides global coverage, so that's also good for the continuity. Uh, it's scalable and flexible to accommodate for variating traffic over the coverage and over time, and is secured and resilient, as uh, we will see later. Uh, focusing on the future communication infrastructure, SATCOM represents a key complementary component for the FCI that will enable I4D on the short term and trajectory-based operations on the long term in compliance with ATN V1 and ATS V2 performance standards. Still talking about performance, SATCOM can provide safety services in line with the required performance first over ATN OSI infrastructure, especially in Europe, and sharply also over ATN IPS, maintaining though the interoperability between OSI and IPS. That's something that we are also working on uh, in cooperation with CESAR. SATCOM can have a key role as an interoperable element also for what concerns CM integrated CNS services. So communication, navigation and surveillance services are, are uh, going towards a sort of integration and SATCOM is a common element for those. And last but not least, um, some concepts were introduced at the end of the last uh, webinar related to multi-service approach, uh, which would basically mean providing different types of services as long as the critical services are uh, maintained uh, segregated. And also other concepts more on a technological point of view for multi-orbit or multi-frequency systems that could be possible in the future with SATCOM technologies. So having said that, I would like to go briefly through a timeline of the ESA IRIS program, past, present and future, starting back from 2014, when with two legacy studies, two uh, feasibility studies, we carried out Antares and Thomas. Specifically with Thomas, we were looking at how um, a dedicated system could be uh, offering service, services for aviation communication and air traffic management. Uh, targeting though the uh, specific design of a dedicated system, while Antares was more focusing on the idea of offering the same services by reusing and adapting an existing infrastructure, which is what we adopted with Inmarsat in the Iris precursor specifically, that followed the initial legacy studies and concluded su successfully in 2018 with the validation of the IRIS technology against uh, ATSV2 by means of uh, flight trials with NLR. In the same year, uh, 2018, we also kicked off the current contract still ongoing, uh, IRIS Initial Operational Capabilities or IRIS IOC implementation, which uh, basically targets indeed the implementation of the initial operational capabilities of IRIS, specifically with IRIS IOC service certification provision and uh, the commercial flight, the pre-commercial flights that will be held by the end of 2022. But before going there, uh, in 2021, so last year, we also got uh, the technical agreement for the IRIS service provision. And I'd like to mention that the current uh, contract also covers the design of the longer term features which are, are targeted by the system, a so-called Full operational capabilities FOC, IRIS FOC design. This is something that is, has been ongoing uh, till now and will be further consolidated in 20, starting from 2022. So um, soon, we are already working in the next uh, to kick off the next phase, which is uh, the IRIS global, which is under preparation and is expected again to be kicked off in 2022. 
uh, bringing forward the full operational capabilities aspect. Um, I already mentioned that by the end of this year, we will start to see the first pre-commercial flights. And uh, at the beginning of 2023, we expect to have the IRIS IUC service certification. An aspect that I did not mention uh, is that we are also in the current program uh, prototyping uh, an, an early um, version of the ATN IPS solution, still in cooperation also with the CESAR validation activities, that hopefully will lead to have a mature solution validated on ATN IPS by 2024, of course, in, a, in accordance with the standardization progress. So uh, very briefly, the IRIS key features that will be also touched by the next uh, presentations. So uh, starting from performance, well, I already said we are targeting compliance with ATN V1 and ATS V2 performance standards in continental airspace while maintaining legacy services for oceanic areas. Then talking about the, the features, the characteristics that were inherited by the fact that we acquired somehow a pre-existing infrastructure, the coverage is, first of all, uh, as we said already also in the previous webinar, one of the key uh, characteristics of uh, using SATCOM, because with three geosatellites, we can cover the overall globe within the plus minus 70 degrees latitude. So immediate coverage is already available for Europe, but is also scalable to become a global system potentially. The other very important aspect that comes uh, with the current uh, existing system um, is that IRIS can have immediate bandwidth available for a variety of services, not only safety critical, but also sufficient for data hungry services like AOC services. And uh, another important item that I'd like to mention is uh, related to a capacity study for IRIS that we performed either together with the IRIS consortium in 2020, which showed that uh, in order to um, offload successfully VDL mode 2, there, is, uh, there would be enough capacity available till 2024, considering the forecast of uh, traffic growth. Uh, 2040, sorry. So, um, for what concerns... Uh, <laughs> No idea. So for what concerns other key features, uh, instead, um, talking about security, IRIS is offering a sub-network level secure data link service and also a redundant system that is still part of the main infrastructure, as we will see later. And last but not least, it will be possible to have immediately um, the, the service complementing in a dual link mode the existing terrestrial data link. So I would like just to conclude this brief introduction talking about the sustainability aspect because it's becoming more and more important as uh, shown also by the recent Euro control talks and workshops on sustainability. And uh, I think it deserves attention for the community indeed. So uh, some context, it was estimated that avi aviation is responsible uh, for something between three and 4% of the overall European Union's, Union uh, greenhouse gases emission in uh, 2019. And this corresponds also to the 2% of the total global emission. Actually, if you look at the graph, focusing uh, on the transport sectors in Europe in 2019, aviation uh, basically is responsible for 14% of the total CO2 emissions among the various types of transport. So Eurocontrol has estimated that ATM modernization is a key pillar on which we should act, together with other pillars actually which are uh, quite important, like the, the sustainable aviation fuels is one of the main ones, but also ATM modernization is uh, estimated to be able to contribute to the sustainability and specifically to achieve a 5 to 10 percent reduction of the CO2 emissions in Europe. Now, IRIS is uh, one of the key enablers of this modernization that will uh, basically allow to achieve these uh, aviation sustainability goals. And uh, specifically, we also performed some internal assessment at ESA, where we saw that adopting a realistic equipage rate ramp up, uh, based also with the recent, uh, on the recent uh, FCI business case assessment, IRIS could potentially contribute to save up to 1.5 to 3 million tons of CO2 emissions per year in average, if we look at the time uh, frame 2024-2040. So that's quite a, a good aspect to look at, I think. And that concludes my presentation. So I hand it over back to the chairman, Antonio. Thank you very much, Martina. Just on time, perfect timing. Um, the next presentation is, uh, as I said, Inversat, but in between, 
a poll will uh, pop up on your screen, so it will be nice if you can answer. Uh, there is no correct answer, uh, probably. It's just an open question, so don't be don't be scared on uh, answering properly or not. It's just uh, nice to have an interaction with uh, all of you. In the meanwhile, uh, I, I'll try to introduce the next speakers. Only message will be. CB Soreda Perez and uh, Dale Irish will uh, will take uh, care of the presentation of Imerset. CB works in Imerset since uh, 2015 as a project director for the IRIS project, as we said, the IRIS development program with a partnership with the European Space Agency. She leads the IRIS activity for the Imerset Aviation Business Unit, and in particular, she ensures she ensure, ensure the overall coherence from the strategy and the business perspective in, in Immerset and is responsible for relation with key operation institutional and industry stakeholders. Before joining Immerset, she was working uh, for uh, air traffic management and aviation for more than 20, 20 years in various positions in, uh, in Thales, in Airbus and uh, in, uh, in other consulting firms. Uh, Dale Irish uh, is an experience over 30 years experience in satellite communication industry. Uh, she has, he has a background in physics. Uh, they started out in semiconductor industry in California and work in telecom uh, in Australia, like him. Uh, he's now in the um, head of the tech delivery group within the Massachusetts City of Division. And uh, he's very much involved in the connectivity uh, for FlyDeck. Uh, and, uh, and focusing the process, introducing the latest generation of IP enabled communication, borderline fit position of Airbus, Boeing, and other air framers. So um, we we see that uh, there is quite uh, an answer uh, available from the poll. Uh, I don't know if somebody wants to comment uh, on that. Uh, Philippe, how many we we have in terms of percentage of uh, the audience? In terms of uh, yeah, reply, uh, so stopped it before, but there was an overwhelming reply on all of the above. Very good, very good. So it's nice to see that, uh, yeah, there is quite an understanding that uh, uh, Satcom might might uh, support uh, both the data link capacity issue we experience in Europe as a user. Uh, of the avionic, uh, of aviation systems and uh, both improving also performance and data link. So it's uh, actually nice to see there is uh, there is quite a large awareness on, on this. So said that, uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, Sylvie, you can uh, upload your presentation. Meanwhile, so we can, uh, we can start the next session that is called Motivation for Iris and Iris Technical Overview. Seems the presentation is not loading. <laughs> Sometimes it happens. We don't hear you, CB. You're muted, I guess. I don't know why I could not reactivate my mic. <laughs> can you now, hear me now? Now we can hear you, but we don't see yet your presentation. So okay, I think I was not allowed it to share before, so I will try again. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Is coming. Is yeah, we're there. Thank you, Sibi. Can Thank go. you very much. And uh, again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So today, um, I will begin in Marsa presentation. I will go very quickly on the motivations for IRIS and a few IRIS specifics. And then Dale will cover the uh, system architecture and to end concept performance. We talk about system maturity and I will close the presentation with a little bit of the benefits for deployment. So starting with the motivation for IRIS, uh, it's clearly underlined in the digital European sky that um, a digital cockpit and a digital ATM is needed to really deliver the European Green Deal and Europe fit for the digital age. It's also underlined in the various analysis uh, of the VDL mode 2 uh, infrastructure, that is the uh, datacom infrastructure today, that there are some VDL mode 2 limitations 
and that today they are already impacting the airline's operation and air traffic management. And tomorrow, they will be even more demanding in terms of performance and also uh, in terms of data hungry services to introduce the future ATM concept like initial 4D trajectory and full 4D trajectory, but also the automation that is planned as per the ATM master plan, but also the airline's operation will need uh, new services so that they can better predict and manage the, the flights from end to end. When considering deploying a new technology, you uh, obviously need to have some lead time to equip a share of the European fleet uh, with an additional technology. So this is why it is important uh, when thinking about um, um, the benefits of an early deployment uh, to have in, pl in place a coordinated deployment plan basically between the air airborne and the ground side. And this decision, as Jackie mentioned, is uh, being discussed at the time being at the level of uh, ND Tech uh, Group. Coming to the IRIS project, so we was launched, as Martina explained, as a partnership between uh, European Space Agency and Inmarsat. And what we have been doing since uh, 2014, I think, we have been uh, together with ESA and partners designing, developing, and validating the service that is running on the Inmarsat infrastructure. We are about to deliver the first pre-commercial flights that will use the IRIS technology. And uh, also we are in the process of certification of the service, uh, of the service against EASA requirements for pan-European services. A little bit of uh, IRIS specific, so Mar I will go quick on this one because Martina has already addressed some of them. Uh, I will start obviously with the technology maturity. This is, this is uh, really a big benefit of, of all the activities that we were able to, uh, to do with ESA support. Um, the Inmarsat SBS service is already operational and this is uh, basically the, the service that is supporting the IRIS uh, service. So, uh, IRIS is simply an application, let's say, that is running on the infrastructure that is already operational for Inmarsat SBS service. Uh, in terms of avionics, uh, commercial products are already available. The small add-on for this specific ATN service is under finalization, and it will be certified uh, later this year. And in terms of uh, readiness of service, the target is to have the operational service ready by Q2 2023. In terms of uh, benefits, of obviously, um, SATCOM technology allows to cover a very large area with no uh, ground deployment. And this is why with IRIS, there is a pan-European immediate coverage that is possible as soon as the service is operational. So um, the service will be available for the entirety of Europe and even more than that. Um, in the FCI business case, it was um, the, the service area was the extended service coverage. That includes, uh, of course, the oceanic uh, airspace, part of the oceanic airspace. As I mentioned, there's no need for a ground infrastructure, so there is a low complexity uh, of uh, deploying the service to the NSPs as it will connect using the existing ATN backbone. And there is a centralized service distribution per design, uh, and that is compliant with the, um, uh, I would say, the defragmentation of CNS that is really uh, supported by CESAR and by the European Commission. In terms of uh, global footprint and regional footprints, uh, we are talking about Europe now, but obviously uh, with the satellite coverage uh, today within Marsat 4 AlphaSat and the i 6 that, that, that are being introduced, we are really providing already a global service. And with the extension of the ATN V1 and V2 services um, over ATN IPS, um, we are in a global um, solution um, we are in a global perspective. As you are aware, um, the uh, ATN IPS solution is being developed in Cesar Solution 107 and also within the IRIS project. Um, and in particular, in the, uh, as Martina mentioned, in the IRIS Global Solution, we, there will be a new project uh, that will be launched soon in partnership with many uh, industry companies. And there are plans to uh, extend the service to other regions so it will be step by step, but the, the view, the perspective is really global in the end. 
And in this phase, um, we will uh, assess with a, a consortium of companies. Uh, we will assess the feasibility, the design and the implementation uh, options for extension to other regions. The last um, topic uh, that all data link services are in one airborne terminal, I think it's very important to remind that for the airspace user perspective, this is absolutely key. So the, uh, the terminal that is providing the IRIS service and the IP pipe for connected EFB is also providing the legacy services, the fans, the ACARs and the voice. And there is a smooth transition between the legacy and the new services. And there's a, a total interoperability between the continental and the oceanic airspace services. Dale, over to you. Okay, thank you, Sylvie, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Dale Irish um, from Inmarsat. I'm in the uh, in the engineering team, and and uh, we've been building this capability over the years. I think to echo a couple of Sylvie's points, you know, our our core principle was to build on established infrastructure that is mature and in operation. It's all based on our uh, Inmarsat 4, uh, AlphaSat, and the related uh, ground infrastructure and uh, uh, ground connectivity uh, that's been in place with BGAN uh, for over 10 years and in operation. Um, so, the, so all of this infrastructure that is shown on the, the slide here uh, is in place. But as Sylvie mentions, we're working on um, the final elements of gaining certification for some specific modifications, uh, software mods. And we'll be talking about those in a little bit more detail uh, today. Um, so pursuant to that, the, the main approach that we take in the, in the design of systems is to retain existing interfaces. Uh, plug compatible on the aircraft um, and also into the ground systems. So there's really no need to change systems either on the aircraft uh, at the ground. And today we already have hundreds of aircraft transiting oceanic domains using this uh, SWIFT broadband based uh, safety service to deliver ACARS. Um, and through the IRIS program, we've been now moving into uh, trialing and demonstrating the ATN OSI. So OSI is a, um, a application uh, that is used primarily in the European uh, data link, uh, v VDL mode two data link service. So again, we've designed this system to be uh, completely compatible with that. And the main element that we're working right now is the multi-link and intelligent routing between uh, uh, SATCOM and VDL. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, in addition, and quite uniquely, I think this is something that's very powerful, what we've been working on here and through the uh, ESA IRIS program and the consortium, we've built a unique um, uh, security capability so this uses IPsec VPN, which is managed through a, a PKI provider, uh, which in Marsat contracts. And the purpose of providing this uh, IPsec tunnel is not for encryption, but rather um, to uh, uh, provide authentication and to ensure message integrity. The threat that we want to address is the possibility of a misdirecting CPDLC message getting into the system. And so we think it's very important and, and a key selling point of uh, the IRIS capability, which is to have this security uh, capacity end to end. Okay, and that's done through ground infrastructure, which is in place and in operation in the MRSAT network today. Okay, next slide. Um, so going back to the, the basics a little bit, um, the BGAN uh, system, as I say, has been operation over 10 years. It utilizes the Inmarsat-4 and AlphaSat satellites. Each of these have around 200 what we call narrow spot beams as shown in the diagram. 
And that allows us to direct power and bandwidth where it's needed. Um, this supports ships at sea, uh, land users like the BBC, and as well as uh, thousands of aircraft uh, today uh, over these satellites. Uh, this diagram, uh, just to illustrate the spot beams, there's an additional overlay satellite that covers uh, Europe and uh, Asia, uh, and that, that enables us to have uh, uh, additional coverage, uh, particularly in the European area for this. Um, the BGAN system is, is uh, rate adapted. So in other words, Depending on the, uh, the, the size of the antenna, its, uh, its location, uh, whether or not there, there is some sort of fading or, or blockage, the system will rate adapt to give it the best uh, speed uh, depending on the available link uh, condition. Uh, it's a pretty advanced system. Uh, and um, we continue to operate this, and it will be moving on to the Inmarsec satellites, the first of which was launched uh, uh, earlier this year. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just a little bit more into um, the ground infrastructure. As I say, we're utilizing our existing uh, network, and we have uh, larger station facilities at Pomalu, which is in Hawaii, uh, at Perth, and then two sites, Burham, which is in the Netherlands, and Fucino, which is in Italy. Um, today, to deliver the ACARS uh, traffic for those few hundred aircraft that are already using it for Oceanic, we have something called an AGGW, which is an air ground gateway. And what that does is translates the messages that are uh, flowing through the SAT link uh, onto the established um, ACARS networks uh, operated by uh, CETA and Collins. Um, and those ACARS messages are managed by them to the uh, Air, uh, ANSPs and to airline operational centers. Okay, next slide. Um, and what we've recently done is added further gateways <clears throat> that support those ATN OSI messages. Again, those are established at two of our stations and all of the ground network connectivity enables us to uh, utilize the redundancy in the network. So we have automatic failover in case of any outage or uh, link disruption so that we can reroute the messages to uh, these redundant uh, gateway uh, infrastructure. And Marsat's had a, uh, a long, long practice of um, uh, developing uh, resilient links. Thank you. You can move to the next slide. Okay, a lot of work done on uh, performance, uh, capacity, uh, a lot of studies that we've put, you know, a lot of analysis into to ensure and demonstrate that we have adequate capacity to, to support this type of traffic. Uh, so, whoops. I'm sorry, Sylvie. Yeah, go back to full screen. Oh, we've lost the presentation. Okay. Um, thank you. That's good. Okay. Um, so we've done this in a way of... Um, uh, first, you know, determining what metrics we need to, to uh, adhere to. And our targets are the RCP-130 and RSP-160 uh, for CPDLC and ADSC, respectively. Uh, so these are the performance targets which are in place for the VHF data link. And we want to ensure that we meet the 95 and, and 99 percentile targets for latency. We've done this through a number of flight trials. First, using uh, an NLR aircraft and prototype equipment, and then further trials with uh, Cesar and, and Honeywell have specifically run campaigns, and we have further to go uh, with Airbus. But so far, so good. The performance fits well within those metrics um, for the 99 and 95 uh, percentile. And then secondly, it's, it's about capacity. 
And as I mentioned, with the hundreds of spot beams for satellite and the ability to, to redistribute uh, power and bandwidth, we've demonstrated that even at the peak um, uh, traffic forecasts, that there is ample capacity available uh, on our network uh, to support this. So it's, it's a very uh, interesting business for us and an opportunity, I think, for everybody to utilize the power of the uh, Inmarsat satellites uh, that are in place and with the I-6 satellites uh, that, are, that are coming up. And again, just to underline quite uniquely, we've implemented a security layer, which we believe will be um, quite valued uh, by the airspace uh, user groups. Okay, go ahead, Sylvie. Now, I think just for time wise, we, we should probably just leave this slide in the pack. It'll be available. Um, but if we move to the next slide, finally, um, we're moving now from the, the sort of trial prototyping phase into an actual um, pre-commercial flight. Now we're working with an airline. Um, it's, we, we can't announce yet the, the name of the operator, um, but uh, we are making arrangements to have uh, their order book of line fit aircraft to be uh, completed with the first of the um, multi-link capability between SATCOM and VDL um, later this year. So, so working through the, the whole uh, line fit uh, chain, utilizing um, the modifications that, that we are working on uh, to this. So that will include the certifications which will require to enter into pre-commercial operation we expect the first of the delivery to occur at Q4 of this year, and then entering into that operation uh, in the early part of next year. All of this leading to uh, uh, an Inmarsat service provider that will go through an organizational cert process. So that's, that's uh, more than just certified avionics, but actually the whole organization around providing a service with the backing evidence that shows that, that uh, the entities in the chain are able to operate this safely. Okay, thank you. So back to you, Sylvie, thanks. Thank you, Dale. So a few words about the, a few words about the, the benefits of uh, IRIS deployment. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the fact that um, this technology is ready for deployment, although there is no uh, plan yet to, uh, to provide a service, in particular from the NSP perspective yet, uh, but it's really a way to anticipate uh, the plan, uh, the, uh, the VDL mode two degradation, as I mentioned. Again, uh, there's no certainty on when there will be a, a, a dramatic uh, capacity um, issue on the VDL mode two, but uh, it's been, uh, acknowledged by Cesar uh, organization that there is a need to complement uh, VDL mode 2. And the good thing is that with an early deployment starting by 2023, the, um, the equipage of the European fleet can be managed using the uh, natural fleet, fleet renewal process. And that is a big benefit for the airlines to avoid uh, the retrofit um, process that is uh, more costly and painful for the airlines. There's an opportunity of an immediate pan-European approach for the ANSP, and it means that there will be a seamless service in the entire area if uh, this pan-European approach is, is implemented. And it's also valid for the airspace users that will be able to use the service if they wish to from the entirety of the flight. There is also a um, um, high um, value for the airlines because of this IP connected EFB. Um, some applications, some new applications and services can be offered to airlines using this IP capability versus the uh, today's ACARS that has some limitation. And it is basically supporting the uh, ATM modernization, as I mentioned, with the implementation of uh, the uh, more demanding concept of operation that has called to Cesar, initial 4D trajectory, full 4D trajectories, 
and this means benefits to airspace users. And uh, as Martine mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it's uh, assessed that more or less 10% of fuel and CO2 saving can be achieved with the implement with the modernization of air traffic management. I uh, just would like to recall again that uh, the benefits of data link are significant according to uh, what was estimated by Eurocontrol at the beginning of data link services that um, data link can bring up to 10% of airspace capacity and this, this has a huge impact to the uh, cost to the airspace users and obviously to um, for ANSP to meet the, the performance target. Um, just uh, to recall the figure from Eurocontrol that uh, the lack of capacity is around about 1 billion euro per year uh, from 2030 onwards. Uh, an early deployment of Iris is, uh, is an opportunity to mitigate the operational risk to the airlines and ANSP, as I mentioned, because uh, it's ready for deployment. It's also a technology that has been uh, used successfully for more than 20 years in the oceanic region. So the technology risk is very small because airlines basically know this technology, they are used to it. It's already a global standard and it's a global solution. There's a, a low complexity on the ground deployment, uh, which again um, is, um, is a great risk mitigation to a uh, future operational risk to airlines and ANSP. And again, the, the certification has started uh, it means also that uh, an initial multilink or dual L concept will be demonstrated, and that's also a guarantee of service for the uh, for the operational stakeholders. And um, just to end with the global service perspective, we are working on the ATN OSI version of it, but we have already a prototype of the ATN IPS uh, system, and uh, it will be validated in 2024. So we are really ready to adjust to the standardization of the AP ATN IPS roadmap, and then the service can be um, uh, can be extended to adjacent, adjacent and new regions. Should be we need to speed up a bit. <laughs> this is the last slide, so I won't go into the details. But basically, um, data link services are an enabler to the CESAR goals of capacity, CO2 emissions, and, uh, and safety increase. Um, and for the airlines, it's really the possibility to, uh, to save delays, to reduce fuel because of route optimization, and also for uh, new app services like uh, um, predictive maintenance, because with uh, a connectivity in the cockpit, you basically increase the predictability and the flexibility of operations. And we are welcoming airlines to uh, really join um, the activities of Inmarsat and ESA to uh, better consolidate the benefit assessment. And this is it. Thank you very much, Sidvi and Dave. Uh, very well received and sorry to push to be pushy on, <laughs> on timing, but uh, you know, it's important as well to keep uh, the time frame uh, as we as we want. There is another poll coming up. Uh, it would be nice to have uh, your 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 view as well on this one. In the meanwhile, uh, for the sake of time as well, I will introduce the next speakers, which is uh, Airbus. Uh, is uh, Thierry Arquin. Thierry Arquin is a Airbus engineer, senior manager in charge of ATM International Cooperation and Cesar deployment. And he's also in Airbus, the IRIS program manager. Since 2015, has been particularly involved in setting up the ATM cooperation project with airlines, airports, and air navigation service provider in various parts of the world. In Europe, he focused on deploying Cesar solution for on, -air on Airbus fleet. Prior to this position, uh, he was leading the team in charge of supporting Airbus sales and marketing activity related to aircraft system and options, all Airbus meaning all Airbus commercial programs. And from 2010 to 2016, it was Airbus local point for um, AWC and voting member at the AWC executive committee. He holds a French as aeronautic engineer diploma and a master in business management uh, in Toulouse. Terry, uh, if you wait a second, we look at the poll results and then the floor is yours. So do you have any comment on these uh, results? It's good to see that people believe that uh, SATCOM and IRIS can bring some benefits to uh, both the air traffic management and AOC services. Well, as I said before, it seems there is a, a already a level of awareness 
on what we are doing and uh, the level of improvement we can provide to the to the the community so that seems very good thank you very much so uh, i leave the floor to thierry uh, if you can yes thank uh, you antonio you're welcome good luck thank you so uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, with you this afternoon uh, I want to present you the, the development of uh, IRIS capability on board the Airbus aircraft today. Uh, obviously, uh, we need several bricks to provide this IRIS service overall. Uh, I will concentrate focus on, on the aircraft itself, uh, where we need the SATCOM terminal and a router which is compatible with the service. Uh, so we take the opportunity of the development of a, a new SATCOM, so-called light cockpit SATCOM which is a smaller solution compared to, to previous generation of SATCOM uh, with a low gain antenna. And we've developed this, uh, this uh, new um, equipment, avionics equipment with our, our supplier Cobam uh, on the 320 family and the 330. It's already certified, sorry, so certified and uh, already flying uh, with a few airlines uh, today. Uh, is going to also be certified on the 350 uh, from December uh, this year. So today it's provide uh, obviously voice capability, data link over a cars and some capability for IP communication, uh, for instance, for communication with, uh, with EFB. And we, we provide also the, this uh, SATCOM as an enabler for service, uh, providing a cars over IP. And this is the this SATCOM that we will use to provide ARIS capability with a, a software upgrade, and I will detail a bit on it afterwards. Uh, just to be a bit more comprehensive, uh, coming from a, an existing generation of so-called legacy SATCOM uh, on Inmarsat uh, network, where we have several avionics box, quite, quite a cumbersome avionics capability, generally fitted on uh, long range uh, aircraft types. Uh, not easy to fit on the 320 family, but possible. Uh, then we are going to, to have a much lighter solutions uh, uh, compatible with the 320, 330, 350, lighter installation, providing obviously as mentioned, uh, secured communication, which is very important. IP capability for uh, EFB flight ops application. And you see that uh, this new avionics can uh, provide a, a weight reduction, which is significant of roughly 25 uh, kilogram uh, on an aircraft and less power consumption, which is quite significant in terms of uh, um, new generation of uh, avionics. Now I am going to develop a bit the, the, the iris de development uh, capability. So based on this light uh, cockpit SATCOM that en already entered into service. So we are uh, developing two evolutions. One on the SATCOM itself with a new software, so-called L4, to provide the IRIS capability. And then uh, on our data link router, so-called the Air Traffic Service Unit, ATSU, uh, with a uh, software evolution, let's say software 10, that will provide the capability to, to route the uh, IRIS traffic, the ATN, uh, ATN traffic over the SATCOM. Uh, so we plan to certify this capability, so-called FANCY over SATCOM, uh, on the 320 family, uh, on the third, four quarter uh, this year. Uh, we will upgrade, in fact, the DHSU, the data link router, and the light cockpit SATCOM. And we will be ready uh, to, to put this uh, capability on board the, the launch customer for the IRIS uh, service with IRIS pre commercial flights to start likely uh, beginning of 23. Uh, in the meantime, we will also develop the function because it's the same generation of aircraft. Uh, we developed this function on the 330 and we will certify it uh, early 23 uh, on the 330 as well and prepare uh, these two uh, aircraft type uh, for uh, to be compatible for uh, the IRIS operational service to, to come later on uh, in 23. Uh, I'm just giving back a, an history uh, for, for the audience because to, to, for people to have the same, same background information. Huh? Um, Fund 1A uh, was developed in the 90s to, to support data link operation in oceanic regions. It was mainly to allow position reporting where uh, radar do not exist. And also to replace controller pilot voice communication at the time 
by a library of pre-formatted text message through data link, so, so called CPDLC. So we used that at, at that time, the ACARS network that was used for exchange of message between the aircraft and the airline uh, ops centers. A bit later on, uh, in the 2000, 2010, uh, data link was uh, developed in Europe for continental operation as well. So for that, we needed a new ATN network, uh, aviation telecommunication network, uh, that was standardized and developed to comply with identity operations, uh, having some more requirements on the latency and in integrity of the message. So the product on Airbus Aqua was called Fans B+. Plus. Uh, and then uh, what is what is happening now on, uh, on Airbus aircraft? Uh, so we had the, the, the previous FANS A+, plus, FANS B+, plus options that was uh, offered to, to customers. Uh, I take the example of the 320 family here. And now we have a new product, so-called FANS C, that will cover all, all airline needs. You see on the right, uh, the fact that this fancy product embeds uh, the FANS A plus capability for oceanic operation, uh, FANS B plus for uh, continental European operations and, and mandates, and uh, now the ATSB2 services, which includes for the trajectory based operation concept, and an answer, in fact, to the EU mandate that will come for new deliveries at the end of 27. So really, the, our uh, strategy in Airbus is, is really to propose a unique uh, FANS product, the, the FANCY, that will cover uh, all airline uh, needs and answer to uh, all mandates uh, of today worldwide. And obviously, this is the cornerstone of ATM uh, uh, digitalization and provide enhancement uh, on ATM for more uh, automation using uh, trajectory, uh, aircraft trajectory data. And finally, uh, uh, we'll extend this fancy communication capability over the SATCOM with the IRIS as a complement and complementary means uh, to VDL mode 2 uh, in the area where VDL is not covered or uh, even in domestic area where we want to address VHF congestion, uh, as you know. So just to mention uh, finally that this IRIS capability will, will be automatically embedded uh, free of charge for aircraft which are equipped with fancy uh, product and light cockpits that come. Because we want to promote this, this capability. Uh, a few words on the uh, fans development roadmap on our various uh, aircraft types. Uh, uh, 320 is where we now uh, propose an offer. And in we are, uh, as mentioned, uh, we are going to certify the fancy over that capability fourth quarter this, this year. Fancy will be will become, in fact, the, the only product uh, on all the generation of aircraft. Uh, on the 330, so, called, so so far we had the Fans A plus for, uh, for operation, mainly oceanic. Uh, and now we are also proposing Fancy and the Fancy or SATCOM capability to come very soon. Uh, A350 uh, today is equipped with a dual stack Fans A plus B. And we are uh, starting the development on the fancy capability as for the other uh, programs. It, we, we will be ready for the CP1 mandate in Europe uh, at the end of 27. And finally, with the, the little uh, baby, I would say A220, uh, he has today an equivalent of fans A plus B, dual stack, and we are building the plan to, uh, to build the, the, the exact uh, equivalent. Uh, of FANCY also on this program uh, for readiness uh, in 27. I will be quick on this slide because time is running. Uh, really, I just want to highlight the fact that uh, this IRIS capability provide, uh, I would say, secure communication for ATC communication, but also uh, uh, additional capability for connectivity for flight tops application, namely, uh, EFB connectivity and, and new crew applications. That's the, the main message. And all that serves also, obviously, as mentioned by previous speakers, the fact that uh, with uh, TBO concept enabled by IRIS, we will uh, improve the ATM operation, optimize 
optimize the uh, trajectories and uh, reduce the emissions. And uh, I will I will go uh, to the conclusion. So really, uh, uh, we are working on a, a mature technology uh, using uh, light cockpit satcom installation uh, in the aircraft that can accommodate various types, and it's really a, a solutions which are suitable for uh, I would say single aisle type aircraft uh, and can be uh, upgradable as well for uh, also for retrofit. Huh? Uh, improved operation uh, for air traffic management for sure, but also improved operation for uh, flight ops and connectivity in the cockpit. Uh, and finally, uh, to give a more uh, global perspective, uh, we are developing that obviously in Europe and we are very active um, in Europe to propose new solutions uh, for modernization of ATM and digitalization. Uh, we should take benefit of what is, has been developed uh, with ESA in Marsat and all the ATM stakeholders uh, to promote this activity and this high risk capability service outside Europe, uh, namely uh, in Asia, in China, uh, in, in the in Americas, and where there it could be suitable for the operations. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. And I hand over to you, uh, Antonio. Thank you, thank you, Terry. Uh, very, very good use of time <laughs> in your presentation, and uh, the information were really, really uh, uh, of uh, high quality. Thank you very much. Um, so I will leave then uh, the floor to Radek uh, uh, Zaruba from Honeywell, which will uh, take the the view of Honeywell on the development of uh, of avionics. Um, Radek, uh, during the 70 years at Honeywell, I've been uh, working on an incredible number of uh, research and development programs in the area of telecommunication, navigation, and surveillance. Over the last eight years, he has focused primarily on SATCOM and Data Link related projects. And he is the Honeywell lead engineer for the ESA uh, uh, IRIS program. Uh, and he's also very active, uh, as you probably some of the audience will uh, recognize him as, as in many standardization groups like Kaikawa, TCA, and Aerokai working group. Radek, floor is yours. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks Antonio for the introduction. So I'll share my screen, uh, hopefully the right one. Yeah, I think you should see it now. I will go to full screen. Okay, yeah, so... Please. Okay, thanks. So, so I'll just go through you know, our view and our perspective and status of the Honeywell's avionics with respect to Iris. Uh, and I, I will start with just, I think it was said uh, a few times today and also on the previous workshop, but I think it's never highlighted enough. So I will start by introducing the, all the, uh, generally all the features that uh, Iris or in Marsat SB Safety, SATCOM enables uh, when installed on the aircraft. So in other words, when we are selling our SATCOM terminals with the IRIS capability or SB safety capability, we are not selling just the ATN OSI feature. On the contrary, ATN OSI feature is just one uh, relatively small feature, I would say, uh, out of everything that is enabled through the L-band uh, SATCOM. Uh, so if I start from the left, uh, obviously the L-band SATCOM is most known for the cockpit voice and data services. I call it ATC voice and data services. Uh, most of you know it's a must have, pretty much a must have for uh, use of oceanic airspace, particularly North Atlantic. Uh, but with what we are bringing now with AT and OSI capability and in the future also IPS, it's also becoming complementary enabler for the continental AT and data link. So for the European uh, continental data link and in the future for so for baseline two data link, hopefully worldwide. Uh, with that, with this new feature, it helps us, as it was said repeatedly, avoid the VHF congestion and enable the transformation of the air traffic management. But it's not the only thing, right? So as I said, we anyway, many airlines use elements that come today for oceanic operations, but also for uh, you know AOC connectivity. So uh, by the native IPv4 connectivity services that are offered through the same terminal through the same uh, SATCOM system, they can be, those services can be used for uh, connected EFB or connected maintenance. So accessing the maintenance data, 
from anywhere around the globe, uh, even in flight. The same you know, weather updates to your EFB or you know fleet management and all these anything that the and again that the par particular use case will depend on an airline. So different airlines may find different uses for uh, these non-safety IP connectivity services. So again, the ATN OSI is really just one of uh, the features that the airlines will have to consider when uh, thinking about the uh, SATCOM equipage. And the last but not least, uh, we are also developing with Inmarsat and ESA the IPS capability for uh, IRIS or Inmarsat SB safety. So the way the SATCOM terminals are developed, the IPS service uh, would be just a software upgrade. So it will be using the same protocol stack within the SATCOM uh, and uh, potentially even the same interfaces if you decide to uh, develop IPS with the same physical interfaces. But most of uh, the functionality will be the same, uh, reused from ATN OSI and ACAR services. There are some new features we have to add with IPS, uh, but we are already working on that. And then there is also the potential for uh, SATCOM, Elben SATCOM to replace HF. So again, there are also these future options that Elben SATCOM offers. Uh, so there are features that we can get today if you install SATCOM, and there are those future extensions that we are working on uh, already today and will bring another set of benefits in the future. So now going to our concrete product and uh, the different configurations that we have. So the iris capable product that uh, Honeywell is offering is called Aspire 400. It's our new uh, Alband flagship product, uh, Alband Satcom uh, flagship product. And it will, it is now available in a couple of configurations and it will become in more configurations in the future. So uh, at the heart of the system is, uh, the core of the system is the uh, satellite data unit, two MCU, uh, small compared to the older Satcom systems. And the configurations that we offer today use another line replaceable unit, the same size, 2MCU, uh, with DLNA, and then a range of antennas you can uh, choose from today. So there is the intermediate antenna with two channels of switch broadband. One of the channels is uh, used for the safety services and shared with the uh, airline information service domain, so EFB or maintenance. The second channel uh, can be dedicated to cabin connectivity or can be uh, used to extend the you know, EFB and uh, maintenance or other connectivity services. Uh, then we have a bigger high gain antenna for class six. These are all products available today. Again, two SBB channels with the same use, but slightly higher throughput. Uh, for aircraft or helicopters that uh, can install the mechanically steerable antenna, uh, we have the AMT 1700 option. So these are all options that are available today. Uh, so depending on uh, whether you want smaller antenna or bigger antenna with a little bit more throughput, we can choose from these different options. In the future, uh, we are planning to develop, to replace the hyper amplifier and the uh, diplex serial low noise amplifier with integrated what we call HPLD, so hyper amplifier, or low noise amplifier, diplexer. So all integrated in one box to reduce the size and simplify the installation. Uh, so that's a future development. And sometimes in 2024, we are planning to enter into service with uh, the class four. So what Airbus was introducing before, uh, as so their current light cockpit SATCOM solution. So in our portfolio, it comes later. We've, so we started with the uh, higher gain antennas and this will come in sometimes in 2024. So these are all the configurations. And as I said, it supports all the different aircraft domains from you know, the CPDLC, ADSC, uh, cockpit data link, cockpit voice, EFB connectivity, maintenance, and also uh, the cabin connectivity. Okay, we, you know, obviously it's not anywhere near the KE band SATCOM throughput for cabin, but it still can provide some connectivity for email access, et cetera. Like, I think it's <laughs> worth saying that when we were doing our flight campaigns, we were using running ADSC and cockpit voice tests on, the cockpit domain at the same time, we were you know, watching YouTube and you know, downloading emails and downloading files, et cetera. So uh, it works uh, and it's securely segregated all these different domains. So if I go a little bit more into details so on uh, how, what is the impact on the aircraft? So the green is everything that exists on the aircraft today, um, only with Aspire 400, uh, Today, we have different Elben SATCOMs. Aspire Founder is just uh, getting deployed uh, these days. So 
the modifications. So the green is everything that exists. So we have FMS, we have the communication management functions, and we have the SATCOM system. To add the ATNSI feature the, and the ATNSI uh, dueling capability, we need to modify, obviously, the SATCOM system, so the Aspire 400. We do have that feature already implemented in Aspire 400. It's not certified for operational use, and I will talk about it on the next slide. So the feature is there. We have been flight testing it extensively. Uh, uh, and this year, we will certify it, as I say, on the next slide as well. And then we also need to modify the, the airborne rotor. So in case of ATNOSI it's in, and Honeywell, it's CMU or CMF, depending on the aircraft. And we need to add uh, with the interface to SATCOM. So uh, we need to be able to send the ATNOSI packets over SATCOM. So there is some modification in the interface. And we need to add the dual link mechanism. We have also done this already on our CMU and CMF products uh, as a prototypes, and we are planning to put it into CMU Mark II Plus uh, product in uh, in the future, and I will talk about it. So these are the modifications, software modifications only. So these are software features that you need to add to enable ATNOSI. And just for completeness, I'm also showing that all this is primarily aimed to enable the 40 trajectory sharing or the ATS baseline two services. Uh, over ATN, over SATCOM and uh, VHF dueling. Uh, so just quickly on where we are uh, with our products. So I mentioned Aspire 400. Uh, we received the, the TSO certification from uh, Transport Canada Civil Aviation Authority for the class six and seven. So the high gain, intermediate gain antenna configurations. We received the TSO last year. Um, that TSO software and hardware, as I said, we did have the ATM OSI feature implemented. So it was part of the core software, uh, but it was not certified for operational use. It was only there as a test feature, which is disabled by default. But we used that software for uh, several extensive flight campaigns. So we had some flight campaigns in the US, one flight campaign in Europe, where we collected a lot of data. And on those flight campaigns, we also included some prototypes of the baseline to 40 trajectory sharing capabilities. So we did have collect number quite a large amount of data from the 40 trajectory downlink over ATNSI, over SATCOM, you know, flying in the US, flying in Europe, and also some transatlantic flights, obviously, when we are going from uh, US to Europe. So that feature uh, is uh, premature and verify and validated in uh, flight trials. This year, we are, uh, we are going to fix some of the uh, problems we have encountered during the uh, flight campaigns and do the formal verification validation and all the paperwork that's needed to certify the OSI feature. And uh, that feature is planned to become available uh, commercially in the beginning of, or certified and commercially available in the beginning of next year. And then, as I said, sometimes in 2024, uh, the class four uh, configuration will also enter into service. Uh, for CMU Mark II Plus, uh, that's the, mod the modifications I described to enable ATN OSI dueling. We are planning to include that feature in uh, Dash 525 update of CMU Mark II Plus software. Uh, and uh, largely due to COVID, even though it was originally planned to become available in 2023, all the programs got a little bit stretched and moved to the right. So it will become available sometimes in 2024, uh, obviously depending on demand and opportunities. If we do have concrete opportunities, we could accelerate it, uh, but currently it's planned for deployment uh, with the 525 update in 2024. Oh, yeah, anything I think I've said most of this. Yeah, I just mentioned that Aspire 400 is uh, being prepared, uh, now being uh, certified as a line fit option for Boeing 777. And we are looking at other pro aircraft programs and anything else here. Yeah, CMF, uh, our CMF products. So typically in our Epic Avionics, uh, we have a common code base. So whatever we do in CME Mark II Plus, is easily transferable into CMF. And we do have it implemented and tested in both the dueling capability. Uh, but at the moment it's on hold and the first deployment would be on Mark II Plus. Uh, we would move forward with Epic and CMF if we see opportunity with uh, some of the airlines or aircraft manufacturers. And then it would be relatively smooth technically because as I said, due to the common code base, it's uh, relatively easy to transfer. And last slide I have is uh, on 
transition towards IPS, just we, I mentioned that among the future features. So uh, most of you probably know that IPS is broadly agreed to be the uh, networking technology uh, to replace ACARS and ATNOSI in the long run. Uh, long run is different in US, Europe, and different parts of the world, obviously. And due to that, there will be a probably a pretty long transition period where we will have to have ATNOSI and IPS in parallel. So you may get an IPS aircraft that flies from Europe to US, or you may have OSI aircraft that flies from uh, Europe to US, or IPS aircraft flying the other direction. Uh, and the, the plan that industry is pursuing at the moment is that the aircraft won't have to be equipped with triple stack. So it, the aircraft won't have to be supporting OSI, IPS, and ACARS all in parallel. We do assume that we'll have to support IPS and ACARS in parallel, uh, but the adaptation between IPS and OSI will be done on the ground through what we call IPS OSI adaptation gateways. So if, for example, if you have OSI aircraft flying from Europe to US, in Europe, it will just use SATCOM to connect to the OSI ground infrastructure and the OSI ADCs. When it arrives to US, if US by that time deploys IPS ground infrastructure or some IPS ATC and system, then the same aircraft will go through the same SATCOM. So we'll use the same SATCOM terminal, same SATCOM service, no change on the aircraft at all. And on the ground, it will be adapted through the adaptation gateway. So the OSI data will be translated to IPS and sent over the IPS network to the IPS end system on the ground. And similarly, with when you have the future IPS aircraft, so let's say Boeing develops an IPS uh, capable aircraft and that aircraft comes to Europe and needs to exchange you know, 40 trajectory of CPLC with the European ATCs, then again, that aircraft in the US will use SATCOM to go directly to the IPS ground infrastructure and to the IPS end system. And when it arrives to Europe, it will go again to the IPS ground infrastructure and then through the OSI to IPS gateway, it will connect to the OSI. Uh, the By that time, it will be already legacy ATN OSI uh, ground systems. So from, from this, what I want to highlight is that SATCOM does have the potential to simplify this transition from OSI to IPS because it has global coverage and because we'll have those adaptation gateways on the ground. So that would you know, greatly facilitate the transition period. And for our products, we are obviously planning to develop uh, add that IPS feature into Aspire 400. So Aspire 400 will support IPS. And similarly, our future CMU and CMF products will support IPS uh, airborne routing capability. Okay, and I think with that, I'm done with my presentation. And we can move to ESSP if I remember correctly. Yes, you do. Thank you, Radek. Thanks for the presentation. Very, very, very to the point. Um, I don't remember if we have any other put, but I don't think so. Uh, so in that case, I will uh, leave the floor to Javier Murcia from uh, ESSP. Um, introduced briefly in his, uh, his, his CV. Javier is a uh, service and GNSS project development manager at ESSP, the European Satellite Service Provider. He had a master in uh, telecommunication engineering from the Polytechnic University of Madrid in 2005. And since 2014, has joined ESSP managing uh, uh, research and development project uh, with uh, ESA, USPA, EC contracts. Uh, currently, is leading the team in charge of Agnos service de de deployment and evolution, Agnos working agreement uh, EWA, aviation consultancy services, and activity supporting ESSP business development uh, in CNS. Uh, he is acting as IRIS project ma program manager for SATCOM activity in ESSP. He has background in project management, system engineering, infrastructure and service validation prior to entering operational ready CMS application development. Javier, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antonio, for your introduction. I will present the, the perspective and overview of the IRI service provision. Uh, the, the content of my presentation is split in these five topics. Uh, what is ESSP? The role of the ESSP uh, in IRIS program managed by ESA the perimeter of the IRIS service provider, the future plans for setting up the, the ISP, the tentative roadmap for the service readiness uh, 
uh, before the service declaration. And final, the conclusion. So I will start presenting SSP. SSP is the European Satellite Services Provider. It's uh, uh, a company with seven uh, shareholders, seven ANSPs in Europe, as you can see here in the, in the picture. We are a private company, uh, pan-European certified company by EASA in order to provide satellite navigation services. Uh, in a nutshell, we are the, the, the EGNO service provider the European uh, SBAS satellite system. Our participation in, in IRIS, we started uh, working in phase one and phase two, bringing our experience in space-based CNSS solution and European service provision and certification. And for that reason, we work developing high level and roadmap uh, activities for service provision and certification uh, layer identifying key activities for the future ISP setup. And on top of that, we are participating also supporting the pre-commercial flights uh, as part of the ANSPs group participating in phase one and phase two. If I remember well, I guess we are uh, around uh, 13 ANSPs involved in, in the pre-commercial flights. Thanks to that, uh, we have paved the way for the future activities to set up the ISP. For that reason, Inmarsat and ESSP signed recently a memorandum of collaboration announced recently during the World ATM Congress uh, held in October. This is a, a technical agreement to move forward on the service readiness. And for that reason, we are working on the future activities to finally uh, build the, the ISP uh, in order to be certified by us. All these activities uh, have been proposed to, to ESA as part of the next phase of the project, the, the IRIS IOC project, and uh, will be included or have been included in the IRIS SATCOM Global Solution. And ESA is uh, uh, evaluating this, this proposal. With this slide, I would like to describe the high level overview of the IRIS end to end operational chain, showing you who does what, roles, and responsibility splitting four uh, segments, a spec segment, service segment, ground segment, and user segment. Starting from the center of the figure, the, the ISP, the IRI service provider, this is the, the service layer. The, the ISP will be certified by EASA in order to provide pan-European services to European continental uh, air space in compliance with the standards and the European uh, implementing rules. And the target services will be focused on ATM baseline one and ATS baseline two, as presented by my colleagues in the previous slots. The ISP will be responsible for the end-to-end -end operational chain from the onboard uh, uh, antenna, the aircraft antenna installed on board until the ground ground router at the entrance of the ATSP. So the ISP will be providing these services, but as added value, the ISP uh, will be providing uh, other products to the end users because the ISP will be the single interface, the window to our users. For that reason, the, the ISP will be providing warning and alerts, uh, will be uh, monitoring real time the performances of the service. We have legal recording and forecast and will be providing reports in daily, weekly, and monthly basis through end users taking benefits of different communication channel, website or others. On the right side, uh, the high ground uh, segment, the space segment, Inmarsat is responsible for that as satellite service provider. Uh, my colleague Dale uh, has presented very well the, the architecture on this, on this part. And I will move, or I will come back again to the center of the figure for the ground ground segment, the communication network providers, this is the terminology used based on the information included in the standards, in the maps, the Eurokai document 242C. And the communication network providers will be responsible to exchange data from the meet me point at Itmarsat site until the ground ground router at the entrance of the ATSPs. Uh, it is contemplated two different communication layers. From one side, ATN OSI layer um, that will be provided by the current CSPs, CTAR callings. And the other layer, IP layer, through the new PENS connectivity. On the right side, we have the, the user segment, the, the ASP, 
who will be the, the end users. Don't forget that the ISP will have to establish different service level agreement with the different actors in this end-to-end -end operational chain. As I mentioned before, we, we are moving forward uh, as next steps in, in, phase, uh, in next phases of IRIS IOC in order to have the service readiness before the service declaration. In this slide, I would like to present you the key pillars, a subset of the activities to be performed by ISP to, to be uh, successful uh, certified. As service modeling, we will develop the full subset of process, procedures, and manuals. We will include in the concept of operation the service layer. The service definition document, this is the key document requested by IASA for the certification. In this document, the ISP will have to describe the system, the service specification, the performances, because it's the commitment of our users. The service level definition, as I mentioned before, we will have to define KPI and metrics and to do a flow down from this KPI to the service level agreement to be established between the ISP and the different actors. The service provision tools, uh, in a nutshell, the, the service center will have, will have four core tools, the user super website, the ticketing tool, the NOTAN tool, and the service performance monitoring tool. Don't forget that all the activities will have to be injected as part of the data package to be provided to EASA to be certified. And the certification will be key for this next phase of the project. And I would like to remark also that in order to ensure the security of the end-to-end -end operational chain, security and several security requirements will be a must. And last but not least, uh, taking into account different development, different studies, we will complement the current business case already developed as part of phase two, taking into account inputs from FCI, from CSR 107 solution, or evolution of the technologies. As mentioned by my colleagues, we will, have into, we will take into account also the transition from ATN OSI to IPS, et cetera. In order to perform these activities, this is the tentative schedule aligned with the IRIS phase two. As mentioned by Radek and, and Thierry, the avionic certification uh, is very important before the pre-commercial flight trials. The activities to be executed as part of the IRIS at COP global solution should be totally aligned with the pre-commercial flight trials. In a nutshell, the core or the main target, the main goal for the next phase will be the service preparation activities. As I presented before, we need to put the focus on the ICD, the tools, development, deployment, validation, the KPI, the service level agreement, et cetera. And it's very important also to have in mind that we will prepare a validation plan split in two different phases. Phase one will be an operational data validation. In this phase, we will validate or process procedures and the, uh, the tools deployed in the service center. But the phase two will be the most important part, the end-to-end -end operational validation, totally aligned with the pre-commercial flight trials. We will take benefits of more than 7,000 flights to test the system, to test the service, and to provide evidences to ESA. With regards to certification, ESSP presented the application for to ESA last November. We recently held the key committee with EASA in order to agree the timelines, the documentation to be submitted in each of the audit meeting, because the intention is to obtain the certification with limitation before the pre-commercial flight trials, and after the pre-commercial flight trials, after gathering enough evidences and developing and updating the current documentation, the ISP will have to submit this final version and the certification uh, or the full certification will be provided by ASA. In that moment, the ISP is ready to declare services. For uh, the last year of this uh, next phase in 2024, uh, as mentioned previously by my colleagues, we'll have uh, evolution of the system from ATS, ATN uh, OSI to, to IPS. We will have a, a global solution 
to extend the service beyond Europe will have new users because I'm thinking also in, in drone users in the future. And these activities have been presented to, to ESA and it's under, under discussion to be confirmed later on. As part of these uh, activities under iris.com global solution, I would like to mention that adoption activities will be key in order to foster and to promote the use of iris towards users. And this adoption activities is already included as part of the, fun uh, the future communication infrastructure business case under, develop the, under development by, by Eurocontrol. I would like to conclude uh, with these five remarks. IRIS is a complementary technology to BDL Mold 2, bringing benefits to the community in terms of capacity, coverage, enabling initial 4D trajectory. The target service will be ATM Baseline 1 and ATS Baseline 2 in European continental aerospace in compliance with standard European regulation. To consolidate IRIS as an integral part of the European ATM backbone network, to fully interface with evolving pan-European ATM infrastructure, and develop IRIS as a global solution beyond Europe as a strategic element for the service provision in a multilingual environment. ISP participation is key, as I mentioned, during the pre-commercial flights prior to the service declaration. In order to ensure the end-to-end -end operational chain testing and, of course, the IRIS service readiness. And the last one is the most important. IRIS certified service will be a reality in the short term. As you can see in the, in the Roma presented, capable of providing performances with high capacity, safe, and secure data link environment. That's all for, from my side. Thank you, Javier. Uh, thank you for the comprehensive presentation. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all, the, all the presenters for, uh, for the timing, uh, we are almost on time. <laughs> And uh, and for the for the quality of the presentation, I hope uh, the information we provided to the audience was uh, a, a good starting point to uh, to increase uh, uh, the the awareness and the confidence on IRIS system as a solution for ATM. So I, I will I will take uh, well there is another another poll coming up uh, and this will be uh, for. Uh, for all of you and for uh, Javier to comment later on. It will be interesting to see the results in a few seconds. Uh, in a few seconds as well, uh, I will open a, um, a question and answer session. We saw many questions have been uh, uh, already answered in some way in written form by one or more than uh, the panelists. For the one we were not able to answer today, we will try to achieve, uh, to, to, to reach out for an answer through email or uh, through available answer on websites. But uh, I'd like to take a few, few questions uh, and combine them together uh, in a in few seconds. But uh, first, uh, Javi, if you have uh, any, any reply to this? Or any comment on this uh, pool or quiz? Or well, the pool, the, the right answer, because uh, the service, the ISP, will be certified by EASA in the short term for European continental aerospace. The right answer is the second one, because mm -hmm. the first one, although the, the platform developed by MRSAT is providing legacy services, IPS is not ready for the timing. For that reason, the, the correct answer is the second option. Yeah, it's very, it's very, it's very true. Uh, I would like to underline that through the the global uh, Iris Global Solution, which is the next step of the Iris program, we try to tackle also um, uh, service provision uh, globally, uh, geographically speaking, but also service wise. So trying to catch also IP solution, and uh, considering that we are compatible with this, this will be important to underline. So now coming back to uh, some of the questions, I was reviewing uh, a few questions that were uh, kept open. Uh, there were a number of questions associated to the green value of IRIS and uh, how this has been computed, uh, what kind of uh, uh, information uh, and which kind of uh, assumption has been taken into account in the evaluation of the 10% saving on CO2. Maybe Martina, you can elaborate a bit on, uh, on this. Yeah, sure. So, 
<laughs> so maybe just a few information more to clarify. The, the scope of the assessment indeed was to have a qualitative and quantified uh, uh, upper bound of what could be the benefits achievable thanks to ATM modernization and in particular to IRIS. And uh, they are based uh, on calculations and on assumptions that come, first of all, from the 5 to 10 percent reduction target that has been estimated uh, by Eurocontrol. And uh, I think in general, it's, uh, it's been declared in the Master Plan 2020, ATM Master Plan 2020, that this was uh, possible. So assume, assuming this 5 to 10 percent um, possible reduction of emissions, uh, we then considered the absolute data coming from the European Environmental Agency for what concerns CO2 emissions of, uh, related to aviation, international and domestic. And um, the, this has been basically um, scaled according to the assumptions on the equipage rate. But uh, it, the, the data are not based on um, flight trials. We only have some additional data that from other studies that identified that in general in Europe, in average, the flights uh, flight longer than needed, about uh, 45, 46 kilometers more than what could be a shorter direct path once that uh, I4D or full 4D actually for the trajectory based operations are um, deployed and uh, uh, operational indeed. This would save uh, time and uh, the paths uh, would be shorter, the routes would be optimized so that fuel and CO2 savings could be saved. This, uh, this is the background of the overall analysis. Thank you, Martina. And yes, there were also some questions about how the, uh, the COVID has impacted uh, these uh, studies. And I think we, we already in some way discounted in our studies uh, the effect of COVID provided that the assumption uh, on exiting uh, the pandemic period uh, I, I maintained, but uh, yeah, well, we are, we are working on it. Um, there, was, uh, there were also a number of questions on uh, the cost of the service uh, how does a uh, IRIS service compare with uh, other other solution in terms of technology for cost and implementation schemes? And uh, um, uh, maybe uh, Sylvie or Dale, you can. Uh, I know we are we are dealing with a CBA at, at the next uh, webinar, so it's maybe important that some participant of today would be present at the next time as well. Um, uh, but maybe Sylvie or Dale, you can take this one about the cost of the service and the approach. Okay, so yes, I, I can take this one. So I will um, uh, refer to the um, estimate that was developed within uh, the uh, FCI business case. Uh, we, it's difficult to, uh, to give a, um, a clear detailed cost, but uh, because we still have to, I would say, agglomerate all the elements of the cost. And in particular, it means that uh, the future IRIS service provider will need to be selected before we can confirm the, the, the detailed cost. But overall, um, when the service is full up, up and running uh, around 2030, it was estimated in the uh, FCI business case that the cost for the entirety of Europe is around 25 million euro per year. So that's an estimate again, can be a little less. Obviously, uh, there are some uh, consolidation that is needed and that we are working on. Um, in terms of uh, comparing with other technologies, so I think the best reference is the FCI business case developed by Eurocontrol. Uh, there's an intent, clear intent to compare various scenarios. So um, I don't know if Jackie wants to say a few words, but uh, the report is already available and we will develop this topic on the 14th of March during the workshop number three. Maybe if Jackie, Jackie, are you online? Yeah, yes, I'm online. Yes, I can do that. You want to comment that. a bit on that? Yes, I mean, uh, uh, it's clear. I mean, we are, we are co co for the time being, comparing the different costs of the different solutions. And uh, what for what we have seen so far, the, the SATCOM is slightly more expensive than a uh, grand infrastructure, but it presents also some advantages. So it means that. Uh, uh, and what we have to consider anyway, that there is a large proportion of aircraft that will be equipped with SATCOM because they are flying oceanic as it was presented previously by the different speakers. So it will be uh, escalated to the appropriate decision body in Europe to take a decision regarding the implementation. 
And the current business case is uh, basically concluding that the best is to go for the multi-link uh, implementation in which we are going to have a SATCOM element anyway. And as a large proportion of aircraft will be equipped, it will be, uh, uh, it will be very attractive for ADSP to use this service that will reduce the load on VDL2 and improve the overall performances. Now, regarding the benefit, the benefit will appear only when the application will be implemented. So it's a multi-dimensional, uh, let's say, uh, exercise that is not so easy to conclude, but uh, globally, uh, it could be beneficial for, for everyone, at, at least for the performance of the ATN system in Europe. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Uh, yes, I, I fully agree with you. The, the, the situation will, uh, will have to be evaluated when the system will be in place, but uh, uh, we, we, we have uh, our job now in defining uh, the structure of the CBA and, uh, and find out uh, supporting information for the community on that. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, for uh, maybe something for uh, Airbus and Honeywell, there were a number of questions on uh, uh, potential uh, possibility for a retrofit of uh, of uh, the new um, the new avionic and new terminals in uh, in um, in various uh, ways in terms of cost in terms of uh, yeah possibility uh, maybe uh, Thierry or uh, Radek you want to give us some uh, light on this. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, light cockpit SATCOM is uh, retrofitable on, on aircraft. Huh? Obviously, it's a SATCOM, so uh, you understand that there is not only uh, an avionics plug and play to put on the aircraft, but you have also a coaxial, you have, a, you have an antenna. So, obviously, the down the downtime for, uh, for an aircraft is, is different, uh, but, but uh, it's possible. It's possible. Uh, on the 320, on the 330, and it will be possible on the 350 once it will be also certified. So regarding the, the fancy, which is, which is the, our data link uh, router, uh, it's also retrofitable on, uh, on the current solution for, for customers that have, to, have today uh, FANZ A plus or FANZ B plus. So it's possible to retrofit. Uh, it's not only in some cases, not only the uh, data link router, in some cases, you need the FMS uh, flight management system upgrade as well to be able to send the downlink trajectory from the FMS to the data link router and route that on uh, ADSC, uh, so-called extended projected profile. But uh, to answer quickly, yes, uh, there are possible retrofit solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, well, I think this apply to uh, the honor world solution as well, Radek, right? Yeah, 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 that's true. So, so oh, we need to distinguish the SATCOM itself. Uh, so in our case, Aspire 400, that yeah. will certainly be retrofitable. And it's also worth mentioning that if there is an aircraft that already has some legacy SATCOM uh, that may run, be running into obsolescence issues or they just want to upgrade for to say wait or whatever, or get the new features, then you don't need to change the antenna wiring and the antenna itself because the SPR 400, that's you know, sort of given by the architecture of the element SATCOMs. So if there is already aircraft equipped with element in Mars SATCOM, then in most cases, we will be able to reuse the existing antenna installation. So it doesn't even have to be Honeywell's antenna. It could even be a third party antenna that we can work with. And then obviously for the CMU or CMF for the detailing, uh, it depends on aircraft to aircraft. Uh, if it's modular architecture like Honeywell Epic, then uh, it's a little bit more difficult to do retrofit. But for CMU Mar 2 Plus, uh, if it's like 737 or some other older aircraft, we can uh, we can obviously retrofit CMU there as well through STC in our case. Uh, very good. Um, there is also another one for you, uh, Thierry, considering ID service free of charge on aircraft equipped with FANCI. Uh, would we the co paying the cost of IOC data traffic? Uh, uh, just to clarify, I think you were mentioning the cost of installation of uh, of the ARIS. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's uh, patch yes, on board, be, not the service itself. Just to be yes, clear. Yes, to yes to be accurate. Yes, uh, when when a, an airline selects the the fancy uh, capability and the uh, light cockpit satcom. They will, bet the, they will have the capability 
to, to access to the IRIS uh, service. But obviously, the communication themselves is, is uh, taken, taken uh, apart. Huh? And this yeah, is uh, the general IRIS communication uh, that will be paid by airlines or ANSP, depending, huh? uh, depending on the uh, content which is uh, sent. If it's for airline operation, it will be paid by the airline. It is, if it's for uh, air traffic services, it will be paid by the ANSP. So. Uh, Thank you, Thierry. Sylvie, cor uh, correct me if I am wrong. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, of course, uh, we know that there will be a service layer on top of it. But uh, as a meaning of the aircraft will be equipped for free using fancy of uh, concerning the ARIS capability. Then the ARIS service is another part yes, of the game. Correct. Um, there was another question also on uh, on uh, Aris uh, uh, as a complementary technology. So the question is, Aris has been said to be a complementary technology, but the capacity is sufficient to accommodate demand till 2040. Uh, so why then is complementary and uh, we are uh, complementing with that the capacity, the existing technology? So maybe some clarity might help. Maybe Sylvie or Day, you want to take this one? Yes. Um, yeah, I think what we see is uh, obviously uh, the safety benefit for the airspace users in being able to uh, utilize both technologies uh, in different phases of flight uh, on the surface. Um, there may be routing preferences depending on the type, categorization of the information. So I think it just gives a lot of flexibility um, uh, to the airspace users. Um, Sylvie, do you want to add anything to that? Not, not particularly. I think your, your answer is, is, is okay. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I... Uh, the main point here is as well that yes, uh, the the capacity we are we are we have uh, studying uh, also in our in our capacity study for the evolution of the traffic and uh, the response we can provide to the uh, uh, to the demand of uh, of uh, data link will uh, will like actually is is proving that up to 2040 we can sustain the delta. I mean the the. Um, the complementarity to the existing uh, system to com to 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 be compliant with the demand of uh, of data link that we expect in 2040 and and forward as well and as has been said this uh, this done in a safe way with a safe link and uh, with the possibility to scale it to the maximum extent possible in the future to extend it in a global way and to extend it uh, in, uh, in other region as well. Um, there were some questions as well. Maybe you, Sylvie, you can... Yes? You take, speaking, my compliment on this one, because we are running for the time being the FCI business case. Please. I think it's a good question why we need to have several systems. There is one clear requirement that we receive from the airlines, the airspace users, is that they want to be able to maintain competition. So even if one system has the capability to afford all the, all the traffic, there is also the need for having competition for the, the procurement of these different services, for being sure that um, that the price are maintained at the level that is acceptable for all the users. That's one of the main reasons why, uh, uh, at least from the airline point of view, it's needed to have several, uh, let's say, communication systems. Yeah, very good point, Jackie. It's uh, actually uh, important to keep this in mind and to keep it in, in practice as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Um, I think this is uh, in some way completing uh, uh, the list of uh, questions I had in my uh, file. Uh, there is another one concerning uh, Immersat to be uh, provider of the satellite link uh, and SSP the provider of the service to airline and, and, and ANSP. So what is the, if you like, the business concept behind the uh, um, ANSFP and, uh, and uh, Inmarsat. Can someone take this one? I, I can take it. So uh, definitely for Iris, Inmarsat is the provider of the satellite links. 
Uh, when it comes to the Iris service provider, we have not yet selected the future partner. What uh, ESSP has presented is the technical agreement because we we have to progress. We have to be able to support the pre-commercial fly. We have to progress on the uh, elements that are part of this ESA program. And one of it is uh, certification. We have to have a technical partner. And then we are in parallel we will continue running uh, a commercial selection of the uh, Irish service provider. Okay. But the Irish Thank service provider will definitely be the interface with the ANSPs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sydney. So I think this is uh, the last question I saw in the list uh, of open question. Most of the other one have been uh, replied already. Uh, Jackie, you want to say something? Uh, in as a conclusion? Uh, yes, first of all, thank you very much to all the speakers. I think it was very interesting presentation to have this overview of the ARI services with the main actors uh, that are involved in, um, in this area. Um, I mean, SATCOM is definitely uh, one of the technology that is already in operation for aviation and will most probably continue to be in operation. The SATCOM services can provide added value in the domestic airspace, which is not the case for the time being because it's not used at least for ATM in the domestic airspace. Uh, business case is ongoing. A decision will have to be taken. It's true that the advantages of SATCOM is the fact that uh, the technology is mature, is uh, deployed already at the satellite and launch, so that can be put in operation relatively quickly. The key element is the, the rate of equipage of the fleet because to bring benefit, uh, we know that um, for retrofit is very expensive for the airline, so therefore the business case that we are developing for the time being is considering just the forward fit, uh, and it will take time to equip a, a, a critical mass of aircraft to, to, to see the benefit, but we have to think in the long term, and we have to think also how to, to complement that with potential other means, potential operators, but SATCOM is definitely one of the technology that is key for aviation, for communication, but not only. We have had some question on ADSB, ADSC. It could be used for other, let's say, key critical ATM services uh, for the benefit uh, for the benefit of aviation. So I think we will know, know more about Iris at the next seminar that will be organized on the 16th of February. Uh, sorry, on the 14th of March, 2022. And uh, 14 March, yes, correct. Uh, so for the time being, we are uh, progressing with the business case. So we expect to escalate the conclusion of the business case for the first time at the decision body in Europe by end of March. So we are not at the end of the story. We'll have still some discussion. You know that in Europe, how quick we are to take the decision. So it's most probably something that will take a bit of time. But uh, I think with all the partners for the SATCOM technology, of course, but also all the others, we are moving to the right direction. And we have to continue to work all together for being sure that we are ensuring at least all the things are done to bring aviation in the 21st century of communication, uh, because it's something that is absolutely required for the so-called digitalization of the ATM. It's also very important for the airlines because we can see that the new aircraft are transmitting much more data. So uh, it's time to have uh, the appropriate communication system, and the SATCOM is definitely one of the pillars of the, the future communication infrastructure. That's Thank you, my, my conclusion. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, fully share your conclusion, fully share the conclusion. We need competition as well. It's a very important uh, element of the picture, uh, but uh, we know that SATCOM is, uh, is one of the potential uh, technology that might introduce uh, uh, added value in the, in the, in the avionic uh, evolution in the next in the next years. So I would like to thank so all, all the all the speakers, all the presenters. Uh, to thank you, Jackie, personally, and to thank Aerocontrol for hosting uh, us and providing this uh, opportunity to deliver information to the to the community. So thanks to everyone, and uh, I guess I hope uh, everyone that has the patience to stay with us will be also the 14th of March in the in the next uh, next uh, uh, episode of Iris uh, information campaign, if you like. Thank you very much, Jackie. Thanks uh, to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you.